<laughs> no, you wrong. In astrobiology, we're trying to figure out what life is like elsewhere. And we have no idea, or we have very little idea. One thing we do have is that the components of life, what we are made of, are water, lots of water everywhere. Color gene? Forget the color gene. You have nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur, and all the things that life is made of seem to be the ingredients of this. Even the monomers, like uh, the sugar and, uh, and amino acids, they're in these amino, they're falling from the skies. So the ingredients for life are everywhere. And so we can say, well, what can you talk? I mean, let's suppose that the ingredients of life are in there, an Earth like planet, an Earth like planet, and we have the amino acids, and we have sugars, and we have water there. Well, what kind of life should we predict from that? Now that's one thing that, that's, so we can start out with ingredients. The ingredients are everywhere. Now biologists want to contribute to this game and they say the following. If we have a feature, some type of feature, that evolves multiple times independently on Earth, then that becomes a good candidate for what we should expect life to have elsewhere. So I agree with that in principle, but every time I have seen that applied, I disagree with it because of what I call deep homology. So for example, you'll hear repeated many times, eyes have evolved independently five times. Now, let's look at that. Now, of those five eyes, they say the octopus eye, and then they have the vertebrate eye, and then they have like a fly's eye. Of those, all these things that have independent eyes, I said, wait a minute, where are these eyes? These eyes are in a head. These eyes are in a head. So the common ancestor of these independent eyes already had heads to them. Now, that means Kind of like a head is a prerequisite for an eyeball, at least the ones that you're talking about that are independent. So in terms of this very, very important prerequisite, there is no independence. Then you can say, okay, what else does an eyeball need? Well, you have some biochemistry. You have some light-sensitive pigments in the back there that register the photons when they come in. When you look at these independently evolved eyes, they have almost identical biochemistry. In other words, the common ancestor did already have a lot of the most important parts of what you're now calling an eye. So the independent evolution of this eye, these eyes, seems like a crazy idea, but it gets by the, some of the best biologists in the world are saying this over and over again. And when I hear it, I say, whoa, I disagree completely with that. What, do you agree with me on this? Unfortunately, I agree okay. with you there, Charlie. There's nothing much to argue here. You're totally, you're totally right. We've talked about this so many times. I, it, um, the, the problem, when you started with this argument saying, well, the life that we have here is a good analogy of what we might expect elsewhere. Well, I could, would say it's an analogy. We might want to look for something that we have here elsewhere as well, but the word good or best, there's just no base on it. We have one example, no way to have a statistics about what life might actually look like. Okay, let me we might be the way the, the Let me disagree with myself. Life. Let me disagree with myself. Since you won't disagree, I'll disagree with myself. Uh. One feature of life on Earth that I think <laughs> that, is, that is happening independently is when you have two units and they come together and start living together, either endosymbiotically or exosymbiotically, and then they form a larger unit, and that larger unit becomes more and more integrated, and it becomes a successful new unit. Yes. And that, I think, I've seen that, for example, mitochondria inside of your body, and the chloroplasts over here in the green. Now, these are independent events, but they, and they happened, I think, independently, and so I would say that that type of event I... is something that we might expect okay, elsewhere. Now, now, now that you get, get me to disagree, okay, yeah. for example, uh, under, amongst secondary endosymbiotic algae, like mm -hmm. the modern algae that dominate the oceans, there's mm -hmm. cucolithophorids, there's dinoflagellates, there's diatoms. There's secondary tertiary endosymbiotic. Well, but they're all based on, on, on red algae. So it seems you can evolve the ability all right, but for this I, type of I, I, I agree. I agree with that. And but you wait, wait, stop, 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 stop. Because you are citing now secondary endosymbiosis and tertiary of the same type of photosynthetic organism inside of another. I agree that that is not independent. What I did say was the mitochondrial endosymbiotic event and the cyobacteria were somehow in the, well, very much more independent than these eyeballs. No, we're I, I about. would agree with that too. I don't you disagree think, with that. Yeah, I disagree with that because I don't think it's an accident that the mitochondria and the chloroplasts came together in the same organism because that organism used exactly the same mechanisms mm, okay. to engulf that organism. It had learned how to engulf other organisms. There might be more endosymbiotic 
aesthetic events. Yeah. You know, based on the Margulis ideas, the, the nucleus okay. or the tubercles and so on could all be actually Okay, let me throw in something else that you did. Now, let's put, try to put endosymbiosis into the same category as multicellularity. So those two events we just talked about presumably happened when these things were kind of single cells, but they might have been also semi-colonial at the time. And then these semi-colonies got together and formed, I guess, bigger colonies, and here we are, a multicellular organism with trillions of cells. So well, that's only one hypothesis about multicellularity happens. I find it more likely, much more plausible, that not organisms came together, but that cells simply didn't split fully. It stayed together. Right. It's a very different concept. Okay, but, but your friend Andy Knoll at Harvard says, has written an article about how many times the independent evolution of multicellularity happened. And he draws a tree and says, it happened here and here and here and not here and here and but here. that's not independent in the same way as the eye is not independent. Because these organisms have learned, for example, cell-cell communication. I know. If you are two cells but, or three no, we're cells, about you have the to common, communicate. I know, but the common right. ancestor of all of these multicellular things had their very fundamental things in common before they right. did that. That's and right. that means that they did not, you cannot talk, therefore, about independent origin of multicellularity. Correct. Well, that's what he does. Well, Haven't you talked to him well, about this? <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a misunderstanding here. Okay. You use the word independent yeah. differently than... He uses the I word think so. independent. I think so. Andy Nall is a very clever person mm -hmm. and he defines the word independent very well. You just use it differently and then you disagree with it. But you can't do that. You I, can't just I, I, redefine someone else's word okay. and then say okay, they're so, wrong. So let's, what we're really interested in the word independent is we want to apply whatever we analyze here elsewhere. Do we have a sufficient threshold for independence for multicellularity two or three or four times here on Earth to then be able to extrapolate it elsewhere. That's the criterion, and I think it's nowhere near that level of that, the threshold in order to use that to predict multicellularity elsewhere. I do agree. Partly, there could be an exception. For example, you have multicellularity, but not complex multicellularity amongst bacteria. For example, the cyanobacterium not stock makes this beautiful round ball, it's called freshwater grapes. There's filamental cyanobacteria. Uh, that's also a type of multicellularity. Um, nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria have filaments of equal cells, and in between there's heterocysts for nitrogen fixation that are different. Mm -hmm. So there's already one type of complexity. And the cell at the end of the filament is also different. So we have already three different types of cells. Yeah. Um, now we would have to look into the exact mechanisms how these things form relative to, for example, multicellularity in a filamentous eukaryotic alga. For example, do we have the same communication channels? Communication no, 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 wait, proteins? don't say the word same. Please do not say the word same. We know that everything from eukaryotes evolved in the bacterial community first. If you agree with that, then you don't ask That's the word same. That is not exact. But it's not exact. I, so no, what? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it's not no. exact. So, you, if you, you, in this case, you really have to look into the exact mechanisms, how multicellularity happens, how these cells communicate. You have between to look the at the cells. exact evolution of those mechanisms. And then I say yes. If well. you say the exact mechanism, because then I completely is, disagree is, with you. Is, because is, people are looking at these right, exact mechanisms and say they're completely different. I say, baloney, no, no, look, there's an no, evolutionary trail. It had to get there. There's probably an entire scale of independentness. Yes, you know, I'm, I'm all about that. Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. We and agree. That, we so agree. We, we, yeah, right. yeah, so yeah. We, uh, we probably <laughs> we should you know we should be more refined here and actually find a way to quantify independentness. For example, we can look at uh, you know very very deep homology. Uh, for example, you might find maybe in some organisms like jellyfish that have light sensitive light sensitive cells. Um, maybe that was already, you know, has a set, its last common ancestor with sure. all the other eyes as well. Sure. Maybe there's developmental sure. genes like the eyeless sure. genes, the hox genes, sure, sure, that sure, switch sure. these things on in jellyfish sure, as well. Sure, sure. But maybe we can find light sensitive cells that actually use a very different pigment system. Well, different from the road up scene. Well, wait a minute. Oh, How many, let's suppose we have very different pigment systems. No, 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 and let's no, no, look no. at the phylogenetic the pigment, tree of those pigments. The pig, no, right, the pig, and they have common the, origin. That's absolutely, I agree with you. But for example, you might have all eyes that we know now have yeah. a pigment that evolved here yeah, and yeah, then that yeah, diverged. Yeah, 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 yeah. But maybe you will find pigments yeah. that actually diverge down here right, 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 from right. non pigment. Right, right. it'll have an earlier well, thing. So you have to say. It'll this be is, more independent. Is, that's right. It's that's not right. independent, but it's more well, independent. I agree so completely. If you want to put a number to it. 100% percent I agree. Now, the whole point is. We're talking about life out there. How far down this tree do we have to go before we can talk about independence that we can apply there? That's, that's right. very far down, much that's further right. than anybody so, who is using right. this so argument today my, my has argument, conceived my of. My argument would be if you already, you know, even if life on other planets is actually based on RNA, DNA, and amino acids, if you have different bases and you have actually different amino acids, 
all of these pins we're talking about are probably not applying anymore. That's because the chemistry will be so different, we cannot rely that any of these things are actually going to work. Jakin, since you and I agree, it must be true, huh? <laughs> oh, you're completely wrong, Charlie. Okay. All right. Now, do you have to go now, or can we keep on we can, going? We can keep going. Okay. All right. Um, Clap the fence. No. <laughs> Well, one thing we didn't talk about is just as examples of what we were referring to more abstractly is flight. Okay, they talk about flight be having evolved multiple times independently. And what is cited are birds and bats, pterosaurs, and sometimes flies, insects. So there you have... Insects is clearly more independent. Yes, yes, exactly. The yes, yes, exactly. Of course it's more independent, but whether it is completely independent, right, which is same, what is usually worse. It's the same developmental genes I, for these limbs okay. that create them. So, in, 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 so we agree you know, that... These are, these are as much wings as those as okay. insects. So uh, saber teeth, saber toothness, same mm -hmm. thing, right? We, so you and I agree that the, the so-called independence of these convergent features do not have the type of independence that's anywhere near okay. interesting Particularly for the extrapolating example elsewhere. Just, the example that you just brought. Yeah. Uh, Smilodon and Thalacosmilus. So, Smilodon is the uh, placental sable toothed tiger that has these long teeth. And Thalacosmilus is the equivalent from South America, which is actually marsupial. Looks officially the same, also has these big teeth. Mm -hmm. And it's often cited as an independent evolutionary event. Yes. But both the last common ancestor of placental mammals and marsupial mammals had already inside this and they had simple genes that make them bigger. Yes, yes, and you just yes. need some switches to make them longer and shorter. Mm -hmm. So both these organisms had the switch to make incisors yes, yes, longer and yes. shorter. And all what happened here independently yes, yes. is the switch was switched on oh, and off. You're... That's pretty easy. That's very, very unindependent in my opinion. 99% oh, unindependent. Oh, yeah, and it's so unusual to ha you, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> someone, someone, someone convinced me at some point about okay. this thing. Okay, <laughs> now, let's, now let's talk about something that's analogous, that's very, very important, is big brains. Now, here's, a, here's something, huh? oh, big brains. <laughs> <laughs> big brains, are big brains something that we should expect elsewhere? Now, this is a, at the heart of a lot of astrobiology research because we're looking for aliens. Most people could care less about bacteria aliens. They want to know about these other aliens that could, are so smart that they could kill us. Or, for example, in the movie Arrival, I just saw that last night, they're so smart that they can create any technology, they can make gravity go up and down. And, they can, and so what we're really concerned with is whether they're aliens that are smarter than we are that could come here and kill us. So the question then becomes, okay, is big braininess somehow a feature that has evolved independently on Earth enough, to, enough times and independently enough such that we would expect it elsewhere? Carl Sagan, who's like the father of astrobiology, is absolutely, was absolutely convinced that there are multiple ways to evolve towards independence and that functionally equivalent humans is what we should expect elsewhere. So and by, he, he disproves himself. Clearly humans have not become smart enough to make you know, intelligence, any features evolved anywhere. Okay, that's, that's an argument about what, whether we are intelligent or not. Let's ju that's true. We're just I the mean, most we're intelligent, probably yeah. most intelligent creature on our planet. I, don't, I disagree with that. I disagree with are that. Are we really? But, well, that's the, I, that's, I would agree with that. So the point is though, what should we expect from these aliens? If, let's suppose that life, like some people believe, just comes, emerges out of this soup of the, that, the water and the amino acids and the sugars, it just emerges somehow, and we don't know about how that does it, but it might be very common. I would say, yeah, maybe it is. But then people say, once you get life, boom, you get smart life, you get big brain things, you get things that are intelligent and can make cameras and rockets and et cetera, and UFOs. That's the part that I don't buy for a second because of, I, I guess because of what we've just been talking about, and that is that, that we look at things with brains and we say, okay, we, for example, dolphins have big brains and we have big brains. And then we say, ooh, that evolved independently. But then I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, our common ancestor with dolphins, if here's the origin of life and here's today, we and the dolphins are the same, 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 and then a beep, there's a, we diverged here about 90 million years ago. This is 4 billion, this is 90 million. And then you can say the exact argument that you just gave for the saber-toothed tigers, the saber-toothed, what were the two, Similodons and... Thylacosmilodons. Thylacosmilodon. Okay, so the same thing, you, said, you already have a gene that can control these, sa these uh, saber-teeth incisors, 
You have a gene that controls the, the size of anything. Your ears, your fingers, your, you can make your leg bones, your arm bones longer, or you can make this thing here. You put a lot more growth factor into the fetus and then this thing gets bigger. Those, the controls of those are a very limited set of knobs and then occasionally something will go jup jup. But from that 90 million year old out of this, to pretend that us, we and dolphins are independent of each other, this big braininess, is kind of, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I, I would even go one further. I would say that uh, too much intelligence clearly for most species is detrimental. Yeah, yeah I would. I think uh, growing a bigger brain would be just a matter of uh, switching brain development earlier, letting them grow bigger. It's pretty easy to <coughs> I think anthropologists actually agree <coughs> that uh, for human evolution, the upright stance and uh, the type of birth that we have in the upright stance was far more difficult and took much longer to evolve than the brain. The brain is probably pretty easy to grow bigger. And um, we might be able to do it in the laboratory quite soon with other species as well. Um, to make the brain useful, bigger, that's probably a bit more difficult. But in principle, I believe, you know, the brain is just modular. You just put more of the same into it to duplicate and make things bigger. You would have a bigger brain. We'd but that's only nervous. if you but have seems, the prerequisites seems, for making a central nervous system. Right, you know, I, would, I would think that most, most creatures become more intelligent. It would be detrimental to them. Okay, let's suppose that they're just fungi. They're, let's suppose there are no animals and there are no plants. They're just fungi. And then they don't have central nervous systems, but they, you know, they do fine. They sense their environment and they do things. Now, would, how long would it take for mushrooms to evolve brains? Do you think that would ever happen? They're doing quite well without brains. Well, that's, that's, what, the whole, that's the whole point. Everything's doing quite well without being human beings. Chimps are very wonderful. They're not trying to be human, become human beings. And yet we have uh, Carl Sagan and almost every astrophysicist I've met thinks that there's something called an intelligence niche right. into I which mean, things evolve. I mean, humans have been doing well in the last few thousand years and we've spread Oops. quite quite a lot based, based on our brains, I have to say. But with the four billion years of evolution before that, nothing of, like that, of that happened at all. So it seems to be a very unusual success. And um, it took a long time to find that type of success. And it might not be a very long lasting I success it, either. I wouldn't call it success. <laughs> but, but, but I, would, I would call it a success. Yeah. We are clearly a species that leaves even a trace in the geological record. That's a success. Anything that actually... <laughs> success to leave big bones in the record that no, you can dig up later? That's a success? Well, yeah, no, after you, the de concrete. The we make, we produce the most concrete. The definition of success is something that's invented by humans. And I would say, well, yes, uh, if we uh, actually can leave a rubbish and plastic and okay. uranium enriched layer and okay. record that you can still measure in a billion years that's sort of a success okay but that's that's kind of irrelevant to the question that i'm trying to pose the that's question enough. it is because no. the question is should we expect intelligent aliens that's the question based on what we know about okay. evolution I think of life this, here this is this is um in principle the same question is why the why the drunk person is looking for the lost key under the street lamp rather than the darkness because it's the only he didn't lose the key there but it's the only place where he could possibly find it because it's the place where light is um, i think looking for intelligent life out there is more or less the only thing we can actually look for with the city project in the moment so if we assume there's intelligent okay. life we can maybe find it because it might send us a signal yeah, that's, all okay, other life okay. is not sending okay, a that, signal i agree with that i agree with that but i still think that it's is fine. irrelevant what is what, what people think, and Carl Sagan thought definitely, not only the selection effect, which you just mentioned, which I agree with completely, but we should expect the intelligent niche to be inhabited there and that planet and that planet and that planet and that planet. That's what we're trying to get biology, the understanding of biological evolution on our planet to try to guess at whether there is such a thing as so an intelligence niche. What did Drake himself say about that? Drake or Sagan? Part of the Drake, Drake. Drake is not the a Drake equation. Well, one of the one of the he just put a probability on. It says, hey, what's the fraction of life that turns but, into intelligent life? But it was that, part he, of the equation, right? I know it was, but yeah. he has no way he of didn't evaluating. Say, he didn't say anything about it. Well, he probably, if he were here and he's he's a very good guy, he would say, let's ask the biologists. And when you ask the biologists, they say, a lot of them, what you and I have agreed is silly. And that is that these other things did not happen independently, and a central nervous system did not happen independently. And we, sh from the evidence we have, we should not expect the independent evolution of functionally equivalent humans. Would you, what do you think? Well, you could turn the argument around. You could say, well, of the many, many millions of species that had evolved here on Earth, only one came to the level of what we call human level. intel. 
human intelligence. You talk about levels I, in the I tree of I life. Do you do these horizontal levels. things. I, I reject uh, you your do. use of level. Remember that you You're want turning... to put a level in the tree <laughs> to create races. That, that's him. And now no, if I want to put not... a level somewhere, no, 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 you no, can't no, do no. it anymore. Nothing to do. I completely are... object to <laughs> okay. that. Okay, we have not... that you is nothing to... the entire argument. I start from scratch. Two words start with L. Okay. Love and level. Okay. Oh my gosh, they're related. So of millions of species <laughs> and over four billion years of evolution, human intelligence, you can probably agree on that term, Evolved only once. I would agree with any type of intelligence agreed to oh. evolved only once. Gorilla no, intelligence no, no. evolved only once. The chimpanzee, uh, you have a, a squirrel over there, it but evolved only once. Every, uh, maybe every individual species intelligence life, evolved only once. If life on other planets evolved based on, on different chemicals, right? not amino okay. acid or mm -hmm. DNA based mm -hmm. and so on, maybe the probability of those becoming far more intelligent than us is much higher. Because clearly the substance we made of our intelligence is really, really bloody limited. If you compare that to the raw power of a computer, silicon-based life might become far more intelligent. So maybe you need actually a totally different type of life, oh, silicon-based life elsewhere, to create much more superior intelligence. This is a slippery slope here, because I think you're sliding into the argument that I feel strongly is silly. And that is, the question again is, <laughs> do we have evidence on this planet that there is such a thing as a in human-like intelligence niche, a functionally equivalent humans, that we can then reasonably extrapolate to other planets where we're assuming that there's life? That's the question. I think I would have no. a great idea how you could test it. Okay. You could look for... Um, Apes in other continents, Charlie. That what do you we, think about that idea? I, I'm, on, I'm on it. I'm on it. We're writing a paper about that just now. All right, right. You just stole my idea. 